V. Anton Sprawl here with another video about how you can learn to think like a programmer. In this video, we're going to talk about dynamic programming. This subject has connections to topics we've explored in other videos, like general recursion, divide and conquer, and even that peg puzzle I solved. I'll include links to all those videos in the description. In particular, if you don't know what recursion is, you might want to start with that video first. So what is dynamic programming? I'm going to illustrate this idea with a non-programming example. This example was inspired by my dad, who worked in a city planning department for most of his life and was always getting questions like this. So, suppose you work for a city that has offices up and down its busy main street. People who run food trucks are trying to figure out the expected demand and how much food they should bring. So they're always asking you questions like, how many people work on Main Street in the first three blocks? Or how many people work on the second block? Or the fourth through the seventh block? Depending on how far they think people will walk to visit their trucks. To answer these questions, you'll have to go around on those blocks and find out how many people work there. And if you keep getting asked the same sorts of questions, you'll start keeping track of the answers so you don't have to redo the work you've already done. Having found the number of people who work in the first three blocks, for example, you'll note that total, maybe in a spreadsheet like this. Now, if someone else asks the same question, you just give them the number off the sheet. And suppose you've already found out the number of workers on the first three blocks, and the number of workers on blocks four through six. And somebody asks how many workers are in the first six blocks. Well, you can just add the two numbers you've already found for the new answer and record that result for future reference as well. And if someone asks for the number of workers on blocks four through seven, you can go count the workers on block seven and just add that to the total for blocks three through six, which you already know. Taking this one step further, when the first person asked for the total workers on blocks one through three, you could have recorded those individual totals for each block as well. That's not any more work, and then you would have had those individual numbers if you needed them. For that matter, in adding up those three numbers, you would have added two of the numbers and then added the third number to that sum. So you could have recorded that subtotal, say of the first and second blocks. Again, this isn't any additional counting or adding. It's just a little extra record keeping that will let you avoid doing the same counting and adding again later. Well, this is really what dynamic programming is all about. In any situation where some problem instances can be seen as subsets of other instances, we can record the results, including any intermediate results we compute along the way. And then, whenever we need to compute a result, we can check our collection of previous results to see if the answer is already there. Now, this idea is most beneficial when the solution to one subproblem can be used to help solve several larger problems. Let's see this in action. Here's a classic example of how dynamic programming can make recursion vastly more efficient, the Fibonacci sequence. In this sequence, the first two numbers are one and every other number is the sum of the previous two. Now suppose we decided to write a recursive function to compute a particular number in the Fibonacci sequence. That might look like this. As you can see, the function's code directly follows the definition of the Fibonacci sequence. If the position number is 0 or 1, we just return 1. Otherwise, we make recursive calls to get the two previous numbers in the sequence and add the result. Pretty simple. But this function is horribly inefficient. I mean horribly. In my performance and efficiency video, I talk about how it can be tough to recognize exponential time code. And that's what we have here. You see, each recursive call could generate two more recursive calls. So when we increase the position number by one, we are going to approximately double the total number of calls in the recursive chain. Yikes. Now the good news is that this is easy to fix. Here's how to think about this. If we're computing the number in the fifth position, we'll need to know the values in the fourth and third positions. But in computing the value of the fourth position, 
we'll have to compute the value of the third position anyway. So if we just keep track of that, we won't need to compute it again. Using that idea, here's the dynamic programming version of this function. Note that we have a new parameter, which is the array we'll use to store the values in the Fibonacci sequence as we find them. Now in C++, we could use what is known as a static array to hold these. But to make this code easier to read for non-C++ folks, and for testing, as you'll see, I made this a parameter. Now, the start of the function is the same as the full recursive version. If position is 0 or 1, we just return 1. Next, though, we check our Fibonacci sequence array. Back in the main function, I initialize this array to all negative 1s. So we can check and see if there's a negative 1 in this position in the array. And if not, it means we've already learned the value for this position, and we can just return it. If not, we'll have to make two recursive calls as we did before. Only we go ahead and store that sum in the Fibonacci sequence array for future use. Then we return the sum again as in the first version. Now we could avoid actually making the second recursive call because again, that result is going to already be in our Fibonacci sequence array at that point. And so that second recursive call is going to immediately return with the value from that array. But I just want to show the general idea here. By storing the result in the array and checking for the result, we can transform the original code into something much more efficient. How much more, you may ask? Well, here's my testing code. I have a loop to call both functions for a range of numbers from 0 to 44. I get a CPU timer before and after the calls to compute the elapsed time. Note that I am resetting the starting values array with all negative ones before each call to the dynamic programming version of the function, essentially making it forget all the values it learned from previous calls. Now in real use, you'd want to keep those previously learned values for even better performance, but I wanted to make the fairest comparison. So here's a test run. These numbers show the number of CPU ticks for each call, and a tick is less than a nanosecond. So the calls to the dynamic programming function are lightning fast, just a few nanoseconds. The recursive version is reasonably fast when the position number is low, but it gets bad in a hurry. This is real-time output here, and it's the recursive function that is making this slow. The recursive function is basically unusable for large arguments. So the performance with dynamic programming is linear, and for full recursion is exponential. But the thing is, you, know, you can easily write a Fibonacci function that doesn't use recursion at all. So we don't really need dynamic programming to rescue us. So let's look at a problem where recursion really makes the function easier to write. And this is known as the knapsack problem. The idea is a thief has broken into a store. And the problem is he can only carry so much weight. In some versions of this problem, it's about size instead of weight, but that makes no sense. So I'm going with weight. Anyway, he can only carry so much weight, pounds, kilograms, your unit of choice, but he wants to get out with the most valuable haul. Given how much each item weighs and how much it costs, how should he fill up his knapsack to maximize his ill-gotten gains? And keep in mind that we can take as many of each item as we want. Now, you might think that we should just figure out which item has the highest cost to weight ratio and fill up with that, and then go from there with whatever's left over. But that will often not produce the optimal result. Here, for example, the heaviest item, uh, weight 7, cost 13, has the best ratio. But if our weight limit is 8, our best choice is to take the items with weight 5, cost 9, and weight 3, cost 5. Okay, here's the setup for the knapsack functions. I have a struct called weight value that holds the info for one item, the, the weight and the value. And here's where I set up an array of these structs for the functions to use. Here's a recursive function that computes the value of the optimal knapsack given how much weight our thief can carry 
and an array of item information. The last parameter is just indicating how many items are in that items array. Now, if you haven't done a lot of recursive programming, this function may seem a little mysterious. What we're doing is, we're trying each item in the item array to see if we can add it to our sack if the weight of the item is below how much we can carry. If we can carry it, we make a recursive call to find the value of the optimal knapsack with the reduced weight capacity. So for example, if we could carry 20 pounds of stuff and we're looking at an item that weighs two pounds, then we need to make a call to find out the maximum value we could get out of the remaining 18 pounds. And then we could add that value to the value of the two pound item to figure out the value of the whole sack if we made that choice. So we do that for all the items and keep track of which value is largest. This is a variation on the classic find the largest value loop. At the end, we return that max value. As with the full recursive Fibonacci function though, this function is horribly inefficient. If we have five items in our array, for example, each recursive call could make up to five more recursive calls. Again, it won't exactly work out as bad as the word exponential implies, but it's bad. Now, dynamic programming. What I want you to see is that this is largely the same code. We have a new parameter, knapsack max value, which, as with Fibonacci, is going to store our previously found results and which is initially filled with negative ones. At the start of the function, we check that knapsack max value array to see if we already know the answer we're being asked. If not, we do exactly the same thing we did before. The only difference is, is right at the end, before we return max value, we store that in the knapsack max value array for future reference. So this is pretty much a mechanical alteration. Check to see if we've already stored the value in the array before we compute. And if we have to compute it, store it in the array. But what a difference this makes. Here's my testing code, which is really the same testing code as with Fibonacci. As before, I reset the array of previous results before each call to the dynamic programming function. And here's the code running. I mean, man. Look at the difference between those columns as the maximum weight grows. Insane. Just to drive home the point, here's a performance analysis of this run. As you can see, the program spends virtually all of its time in the full recursive function. The dynamic programming function isn't even listed here. You see, the performance profiler works by regularly sampling the executable. Essentially, every few ticks, it asks the program, what part of the code are you running? The dynamic programming function runs so fast that the profiler never actually catches it working. And compared to the Fibonacci sequence problem, the knapsack problem is a lot simpler to conceptualize with recursion than without. So at dynamic programming, we're getting a solution that's easier to create and with good performance. Now just keep in mind, when we use dynamic programming, we have to make an array to hold the results and this function is going to be limited by that array. To make the function robust, we should add code to check that our function's input isn't so large that we're going to be accessing off the end of the array. Or we could go one step further and create a wrapper function that dynamically creates and initializes an array of just the right size before calling our dynamic programming recursive function. But I'll leave that as an exercise. So, that's it. I hope you give this technique a try the next time you're writing some recursive code and let me know how it works for you. Please do like, share, and subscribe if this video was helpful, and feel free to suggest new topics. Thanks for watching.